welcome back. How super fun to have peeps from all over the place connecting and sharing and thinking about um, how we are moving forward as secondary educators. I'm delighted to introduce Miriam Miller, who is um, involved, has been involved in um, social emotional learning research and pedagogy for a long time, Miriam. We've had a chance to work together on many projects as well as work together on research teams at UBC. And so I'm here to celebrate Miriam. She's gonna talk for about, for a chunk of time. We'll go back to breakout groups to de um, debrief. Then we'll come back and she'll do one more piece. And then I'll close at 425 to send y'all home at 430. Um, PST. All right, well, hello everyone and welcome to this next segment that focuses on social and emotional learning in secondary schools. I am so grateful to be joining you all from the traditional ancestral unceded land of the Musqueam, tsleil and Squamish Coast Salish peoples. And I am um, choosing to be grateful for this very wet, gray day that we're experiencing and trying to find the same joy that my young son found when he discovered it was raining today and he was excited about those puddles. So just by way of coming into this space, I invite you just to take a moment and maybe take a nice inhale and exhale. And notice the ground beneath your feet. Maybe notice the chair as it's supporting your body. Maybe notice some other metaphorical supports that you have right now in this moment. And just another nice inhale and exhale. When you think about social and emotional learning, we often think about different skills and qualities and attributes that we want for our students. And so I invite you just to take a moment and in the chat, share with us what skills, qualities, attributes, or characteristics do you hope your students learn while they're with you in secondary? So that it's okay to make mistakes, to manage themselves, to have excitement or passion for learning, a sense of belonging. You know, as I was puzzling through this question myself, I, I couldn't help but think about um, my own secondary experience and thinking about, you know, like social and emotional learning and these skills that we hope for kids. And so bear with me just for a moment as we go back in time to the, my ninth grade year. And I grew up in a small town on the island, and I know many of you are joining from the island, so uh, it's there in my heart. And my particular hometown was pretty, pretty homogenous, pretty small. I tracked through elementary, middle, and into to secondary with this, basically the same group of kids. We we're pretty familiar with each other. And I remember feeling just the promise and potential of secondary. I thought, finally, I have a chance to negotiate and renegotiate who I am, who I, how I show up in the world and, and the people that, that will be with me. And so I just felt this enormous potential for secondary. And in that very first week of ninth grade, you know, I was with some of my friends, we're hanging out outside. And I noticed across the way at the, the bike racks was a single student who was walking around by himself and he was clearly different he was out of place he seemed um new <laughs> in fact he was new and I said to my friends hey I think that's a new student and everyone seemed kind of indifferent like yep that there that's new that, that kid's new and that was it and a few days later you know we kept gathering at the same spot and we're having our lunch and I looked across and I saw this kid again, who was clearly different. He wasn't in his nineties grunge kind of plaid and big jeans. And he was wearing cartoon shoes and a button down shirt. And I said to my friends, I don't think that kid has made friends yet. Do you think that we should invite him over and have him join us? And the unofficial leader of the group looked at me with her hand on her hip and said in the most scathing way, Mim, if you go over there and invite that kid to come over here to sit with us, you will never be cool. And I looked at the rest to see, you know, like, is this true? What, what's happening? And no one said anything. So she continued, if you go over there and have lunch with him, you're gonna choose between us or him. 
Is that what you want for the rest of high school? Now, I'm not gonna finish sharing out what the, the end story is, but I will admit here is my, a, a picture I dug up from the yearbook. So you could see I'm on the right that probably I didn't have much to lose as far as being cool or not. Uh, just, this is just who I was. This was part of my identity. But in that moment was one of those, what we would call a sliding glass door moment, a sliding door moment, where there's something seemingly inconsequential that's before us, that is a choice that provides potential um, trajectories for our life. That, that simple choice will change how we are and how we show up in the world. And so I wonder, I return to this moment over and over as an educator, and I wonder how is it we can shift the climate and culture in secondary schools where we are cultivating communities that first center humanity, that move beyond kindness to promote social justice and advocacy, that we do what's right because it's right, not because it's cool, not because it's kind, but because it's right. That we can have communities that acknowledge and celebrate our unique differences in the way that we show up. I wonder in secondary, how can we encourage students to step into their full selves and grow in their identity without the risk of exclusion? And lastly, I wonder how do we co-create conditions within a community to foster meaningful, positive relationships? And so these are the questions that I wrestle with, that I think about, and, you know, there's tension in secondary because of the structures within the way we, you know, secondary schools are designed. And so sometimes we shy away from these conversations. So I'm just going to bravely dive in and, and jump in and, and try to make some sense and make some meaning with you all about how we might do this. So your comments in the chat about what you hope for your students really are the qualities and the skills of social and emotional learning. You've already essentially defined what it is. And when I think about that big picture of what is social and emotional learning, I think first we need to attend to the fact that this is not a new concept. That although it's a, you know, SEL is a Western term that's been popularized in the last 20 years or so, that really the centering of humanity is a concept that is true in, in many Indigenous communities and has been from forever. And so I want to just recognize that this way of knowing and being and honoring our whole selves in relation to others, in relation to human and non-human beings is really a, um, at, it, at the core, at the heart is an indigenous approach to teaching and learning. From the, the Western side of things, CASEL, the Collaborative for Academic, Social and Emotional Learning has created a, a very dis, sort of succinct definition of social and emotional learning. And this is the, the process of acquiring these skills and qualities um, related to emotion management and emotion recognition, to setting goals and, and self-concept, knowing who we are, to having relationship skills and making responsible decisions. These are the, the clusters of competencies that we refer to as social and emotional learning. And we have, thankfully in BC, uh, a mandate to integrate and embed aspects of social and emotional learning across curricular areas, across discipline, because really a lot of SEL um, is, you know, part of our core competencies. So there are many, many skills and attributes, many of which you have already named that kind of fall under the umbrella of social and emotional learning. And so sometimes I feel a little overwhelmed when I think about this because I think we're trying to include almost everything and the kitchen sink here. But I'll borrow Leighton's words. We're going to think big, but we'll start small. And so as we explore SEL, I, I also want to just put on the table uh, a notion of problematizing um, social and emotional learning because quite often social and emotional learning has been used as a method of compliance or as a method of management where we are managing others to meet a particular expectation. And so my hope as we engage in this very one-sided conversation is to kind of 
think of or approach SEL from a transformative lens. So Leighton, I appreciate that you're, you already are surfacing this idea of transformation and transformative approach to teaching and learning. And so within SEL, a transformative approach to SEL connects students' cultural as assets and references um, to academic concepts. And so we are embracing students for who they are and how they show up in our classrooms. We are using uh, and co-creating curriculum that is relevant that reflects our, our current context and our current social context, uh, that builds that positive personal and cultural sense of self, and that also pursues justice. So we're not using SEL just as a way to feel comfortable and warm and connected, although that's important. We're also using SEL to step into and stand up for um, social justice, for advocacy, for um, really addressing more challenging concepts and conversations. So there are lots of folks who are reconceptualizing what SEL means. And I just want to also surface this. I love the addition of um, having the sense of self-love. So it's not just knowing who we are, but also having that positive self-concept that I'm not just confident in who I am, but I actually deeply appreciate who I am and I believe in my value. And that's reflected by others, that others believe in my value that I have a sense of self-efficacy, that I believe I can do things, that I'm capable. And that reflects also with growth mindset. So this, um, these two authors have reconceptualized how we might think about SEL that uh, welcomes um, diversity and maybe takes more of a, an equitable approach to how we talk about this. All right. So Leighton also mentioned that I've been talking about and working in the field of SEL for a long time. And so I'm working right now on my dissertation. Perhaps I should be writing, uh, working on it right now, but here I am with you folks. And so some of the things that have emerged as I've looked at SEL and, you know, talking with educators for over a dozen years is that first SEL is a way of being. Right? And, and so when we think about ways of being and knowing, it is difficult to teach how to be, uh, how to have this way of being. There isn't just a quick strategy for, oh, I'm going to SEL this, right? And so it's this, an embodied experience. Social and emotional learning, which really, if we think about in the terms of development, this whole person holistic development happens within a community. It's not an isolated event. And that community leverages the strengths of all individuals. There's a sense of relational trust. And there's also a sense of vulnerability. In our classrooms, we see this vulnerability often as um, taking academic risks, right? And so if we want our students to learn, they need to feel safe, to feel nurtured, um, and have a trusting community. SEL at its core is relational. There is just no way we can escape this, that it's all about relationships and connections. It's dynamic. It's the, ever changing what we do and how we do it in relation to social and emotional learning. And it's also contextual. So what I share that worked in my context might not work in your context. We have to know our students and know our communities and our classrooms to be responsive to, to our students' needs, to our needs. So even though we might have some core aspects, we always want to know and, and take into consideration how to be contextually um, and relationally responsive. There are so many ways of approaching SEL. There are so many multiple pathways and different ways that we can embed SEL in our classrooms and in our schools. And, you know, as part of my dissertation, I, I found all of these different entry points. I thought, yes, I've done it. And it turns out, actually, it's not an original idea. Transforming Education has this beautiful graphic and definitions there. It's a great resource. I definitely recommend you check it out. Um, but there are these multiple pathways for this dynamic, relational, um, contextual piece of SEL. So first there's that environment where you know, it's safe and caring and nurturing. There are relationships that, that have a secure attachment base. There's explicit instruction of skills that are relevant to our, our students. There's modeling on behalf of the adults uh, and amongst and between the adults in the building. There are opportunities to take up and practice SEL 
in multiple contexts and multiple ways um, as it's embedded directly in our um, instruction and in our curriculum. And then there are spontaneous teachable moments. So these moments where something has happened in the community or in the classroom and there's a pause and we honor what's going on and we um, maybe we gather in circle and maybe we problem solve together, but we have those teachable moments where we really dig in to something that's happening. All right, so if we're thinking about these multiple entry points, the first entry point that maybe we'll talk about is the, that cultivating that community of care. And I think right now, given um, COVID and the pandemic, there's been so much talk about self-care. Educators need to take care of themselves if they're gonna support the well-being of their students. And it's true, we need to take care of ourselves. We need to model that. But we also need to um, experience the care of a community because community care is self-care. And so here's that relational piece. Um, so I, I recommend that you consider as adults in your, in your building, how might you cultivate a community of care amongst the staff? And then in your classrooms, what might you do to create that community of care? In SEL, we talk about the community and the environment as sort of the first main piece that you attend to because it's in that environment that you actually learn the skills, these um, social and emotional competencies. And when we do that, we see all kinds of outcomes, right? There's this uh, sense of belonging, a greater sense of attachment to school. We see an increase in positive behavior and a decrease in risky behavior. And overall, long-term, when we kind of follow this pathway of attending to the environment and then building skills, we see overall increased academic achievement um, and health, wealth, and well-being over the long term, that's what we say. And so one of the ways that we might be able to cultivate a community of care is by co-creating agreements. And so given my short time with you this afternoon, I am going for the low hanging fruit of SEL. Like this fruit, people, the fruit has fallen off the tree. I am just picking it up and offering it to you. Hopefully it's in good form. And so one of these kind of low hanging fruit is co-creating agreements in your classroom. Um, Liberate Ed SEL is a fantastic group. I can say that because I'm a founding member, so I'm very proud of that. Uh, but we look to set, uh, center racial justice and healing at the core of SEL. And so we have a prompt using a piece of literature and the, the full poem is beautiful, but you can prompt or provoke a conversation with your students about the nature of community and how we all have a calling to nourish and care for each other. And then discuss, you know, how is, the, how is your classroom, your community like an ecosystem? And what are the ways that you might nourish and care for each other? What, does it, what do you need to grow? How do you wanna grow this year? How can we also grow as a community? So you might have a conversation like this to then lead into the creation of um, agreements. And this is an emotional literacy charter that first asks folks, how do you wanna feel while we're together? And so often when we co-create agreements, we first and almost exclusively focus on behaviors. But behaviors are also motivated by how we feel. So this first question really is about generating that emotionally safe climate or that psychological climate of a class, of a learning community. How do we wanna feel? And then what is it that we need to do to experience that feeling? So what are the observable, measurable behaviors? And a lot of folks will have this as a conversation in their class and maybe create a wordle for the first question and then list out some of the behaviors um, that the students generate for the second question the second two questions. Um, and then often it's referred to across time in the class, every time you meet, or maybe not every time you meet, but as, as you need. And then this last question is around conflict. So how will we manage conflict when it arises? And how will we deal with uncomfortable feelings? We've said we want to feel this way, but real life is going to happen and we're not going to feel that way all the time. And so what do we do with those emotions? Do we just notice and name them and let them go? Do we give them space to feel in our classrooms? How do we leverage that conflict in a way that might be productive? Here's an example of a co-created um, charter, uh, an emotional literacy charter, charter from Coquitlam School District, where each student created a, a feather 
of a word for how they wanted to feel that year at school. So they had visual reminders across the school. In another classroom, uh, they used a chalk talk, which is a visible thinking routine, just as a place to invite every student's voice right? Because often we do this as an oral activity and not everyone will respond. Um, but they just did this. They had the prompts and the students went around to the tables and responded silently. And then the, the work was collated and they created something together. And just one other example of co-created agreements from a school in Penticton. So here we go. We're going to pop into breakout rooms. Here are your questions. A connect, extend challenge for you. You might only have chance, a chance to talk about a couple of things, um, but maybe we'll put these questions in the chat. Hopefully someone from the team will put these in the chat before you go into your breakout rooms. Uh, but so far, what connections are you making to what you've heard? Um, to the definition of SEL, what you're doing in your classroom. Is there anything that's already starting to nudge your thinking or maybe you're thinking about your practice and maybe what questions do you have? And so we'll pop into breakout rooms. We've got until 4.10 for that. <laughs> 